Thank you very much. I am very happy to be here. This is my last hour in Portland. I wish that I had the whole weekend to explore, but um, it is not the case. The Yupik, uh, the majority of the people that are from my area have a saying, and they say, One must arrive with a story to tell. So the story I'm here to tell today is um, the global impact of energy projects in Igiagig, Alaska. So um, Nate did a good job describing us at the headwaters of the Bristol Bay, but this lake that I'm on, Lake Iliamna, is the largest freshwater lake in Alaska, and I think it's the next largest in line after the um, American Great Lakes. So Iggy, or Alaska in general is home to um, 250 remote microgrids. There are 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska, and Igiagig is one of them. We're one of the smallest. We're a 70-year-round population, but we are well known for our sockeye salmon and all kinds of sport fishing, so our summer population is upwards of 200 and beyond, so our economy is based on tourism. The tribal government employs a lot of people, and many people still go commercial salmon fishing down in Bristol Bay. And we, we run a K through 12 school, and there are 17 students there currently. So I was excited to go online and look at the different um, communities of the main islands. And I decided, after reading about the 15 that um, are part of this island institute, that, that we're most similar to Matinicus Island in our populations, our economy, and in the rates we pay for kilowatt um, electricity. and. I see one from Matinicus. I would love to visit, but it's on, my, it's on my list. So we are not an island, we're a village, but we are like an island in that you can only get there by air charter um, in year round. So we're 200, at least 250 air miles from our nearest hub city, and then that's over 3,000 miles here to Maine. Um, so Igiagig, or rural Alaska, gets diesel fuel in a variety of different ways, and Igiagig is no different. Some years it's um, more economic to bring in a fuel barge if they can come up the river late in October. If water levels have risen, um, the best way we've been getting it right now is from flying it in 180 miles away um, in only 2,000 to 3,000 gallon increments because our runway is small. And um, so, it would, so currently it's being flown in, transferred to a truck, driven to the bulk fuel farm, and transferred again in those... Um, in those increments, and as we all know, that increases the environmental risk of an oil spill. So I am the president of the Village Council. We are the only, only government in Igiagig, and we have adopted the mission that we serve Igiagig, a self-sufficient village with strong cultural and environmental values. Our mission is to provide resources, programs, and infrastructure to enhance our quality of life. And this slide here shows you some commercial fishing but some fish camp, some ice fishing, and some kids out, my kids out enjoying um, the subsistence way of life. So any development our community looks at has got to be compatible with, with um, the subsistence way of life because that's, this lifestyle is why we're living there. And the purpose of this slide is just to kind of show you the impact that renewable energy has on a village of our size and certainly understandable for the main islands, in that we're there for the people and the values, that's why we're living there, and everything that we operate and run is to feed, to feed that. So we have the village uh, local business sector, we have the Igiagig Native Corporation, which is the land base, 66,000 acres, and we have Igiagig Village Council that runs the electric utility and all of these other services, but it's, um, it's for the people, and any time you, so for this project that we did, they were working with local businesses on the Native Corporation land base and for the electric utility. So the local dollar that's offset by displacing um, fuel just, it stays within the community. Um, we have a really strong and ideal network and I, I, I don't think this is unique. This is probably the situation in different parts of New England. I like to start with a historical slide because our Yupik people have been living there for over 9,000 years, living there sustainably in this region. And it wasn't until the era of land claims, which helped open up oil on the North Slope, 
um, that people started living in year-round modernized communities, relying more on these vehicles that needed to be fueled to live the subsistence way of life and heating our homes with oil and running an electric utility that is very costly and hard to get um, oil to the community. So in the 1980s, Igiagig Electric Company was established, but then it was in the 2000s, the rising cost of fuel, that um, we started seeing the price continuing to rise, more of our residents depending on state and federal subsidies in order to make ends meet. Uh, in the region, we have the, of the Lake and Peninsula region that we're from has the largest out migration to the cities. We were seeing schools being closed, and um, it was, it's a bleak photo, a bleak picture with no end in sight, and that's when we sat down and said we need to do some strategic planning and, and we, need to, um, we need to address this. So I think Dennis said it best um, today in the workshop that I, was, uh, that I was in, Dennis Miner, he said, we have to push the innovation envelope if we're going to survive. And our people really felt the need because, like I said, for 9,000 years we were, we were living, living sustainably. But once we had this electric company, that was 88% budget based on fuel, where fuel is $6.33 a gallon, we had a huge problem. Our residential um, electricity is 80 cents a kilowatt hour. Luckily in Alaska, because of their oil wealth, they were able to do a program called power cost equalization, where you can use up to 500 kilowatts in your home, and that would be subsidized and that rate is negotiated currently we're at 58 cents. So you pay that difference. Once you go over 500 kW, then you pay the full rate. And public facilities have the same type of commercial um, power cost equalization, but our commercial sector has no break at all and pays nearly a dollar a kilowatt hour. So we're not a business friendly environment. Um, this year, 2014, that we spent 270,000 to run our electric utility, we brought in an inc income of 22, uh, 220,000. So our tribal government, with funds we're making from our other businesses, subsidized our electric company by 50,000. And that's because we were burning 30,000 gallons of fuel. Um, and I talked with another islander last night, and he said his island burned a million. And that they're looking at, so, um, so that was the number one issue with our electric company. So it's time to sit down and envision the future. What um, the steps our community talked about, we decided we're rural, we're our own government, we can attack this on all fronts. We can do energy efficiency and conservation strategies and we can do renewable energy. So. We determined that any new construction would be at least five star plus. That means the difference between spending $350,000 on a regular home to over $500,000. But as a tribe, we are going to spend the money and make it right now so that our homes are affordable for whoever is going to live in it. And we will weatherize all of our old homes and we will do energy audits on our tribally owned public facilities. We will switch up how we're handling our waste. We will um, start talking about climate change and understanding how the changing climate is affecting our salmon run, our migrating birds, our berries that we're living and depending on. And we are happy to, to say that the salmon run is healthy and sustainable now, but with climate change, it could be, you know, an un we should just plan for the unknown. So looking at food security, we decided to get into agriculture, what can help complement our subsistence way of life. So in the background here you see a greenhouse and we're building three more. And then we were strategizing about ways to diversify the local economy. What a, so now we have greenhouse positions and we have people selling produce to the area lodges. And um, we have wind turbines in the back that now we pay a local to go and maintain or we're paying local contractors to install. We lo started looking at, uh, we upgraded our powerhouse, that was part of what needed to be done, and our buried line distribution. But then we started in installing proven renewable energy technologies where affordable and where that we could. So we put in wood boilers on a couple of our very large buildings. 
we don't have a huge wood resource, so that's not a, an option for everything. We installed um, six horizontal axis wind turbines, and we've been doing some solar thermal on, on some buildings. But then it was also time to help test emerging technologies, one of them vertical axis wind power, which hadn't proven itself in northern communities, and then hydrokinetic power. And it's the hydrokinetic power and especially the relationship that we've developed with Ocean Renewable Power Company here in Maine that I'm going to talk about. It's the most relevant. So becoming a test site was our best option. As a, as a village, we only had a certain amount of our own funds. Our Quijack River was identified in 2008 as the, as the premier river to do hydrokinetic because we didn't have the debris problem that other rivers were having with debris interfering with the device operation. Our, our river is crystal clear. You can see right through the bottom of it, so you can see how fish are interacting with the device. We have the largest salmon run, so if a device can operate without impacting fish in our river, it should theoretically work anywhere else. We have the mouth of this river doesn't freeze. It's too fast flowing. Under extreme unusual circumstances, it will for a brief period of time, but overall, and with the shifting climate, we're expecting to not see it freeze over. Um, and, and we have a relatively short and predictable, very predictable ice breakup season with our Lake Iliamna. So we were working towards step by step. Our power plant upgrade was no easy task. That was $1.5 million. Then the million dollars our village received to do a hydrokinetic project actually doesn't get you past permitting in Alaska when you have a fish stream. So it was the resource assessment, the bathymetric profiling, and the permitting portion. And that's when our council had to sit down and say, OK, we had big dreams, but now let's just be a test center for devices that might come out, and we, could, we can pick and choose what, what we might want to go for. So they did that. Technology companies competed for their own funding. And we would extend the distribution line to wherever that device wanted to go in the river. There were 13 sites identified along the river for their assessment, and so different device companies, they all use a different velocity or, you know, each technology fits a different current, so we showed them what we had and they could choose. So where the arrow points to on the river is where ORPC had their RivGen device deployed. And um, in 2015, they did a, a second season and now we are on this path to commercialization and they're helping us navigate it because as a community, this is not what we're, this is not what our strong point is. But the question is for, that was for ORPC and Digiagig when we sat at the table together, was how do you install, reliably operate and remove a device in a remote, energetic and riverine environment? So with our limited money, we definitely needed partners. And that's where the RivGen unit came from. It was tested in Dinana, Nikiski, and as you know, Eastport, Maine. To us, this was a very large, very large device. 42 and a half feet wide, 35 feet long, 67,000 pounds. Um, in 2015, this past season, they, made, they had made some efficiency improvements to the device. It increased power output by 30%. And we saw a peak of 19 kilowatts an average of 16. Um, over two megawatts was delivered to the onshore station and we were most ecstatic that over two seasons, no impact to fish. In a three-day period, 1.2 million salmon swam by the device. And to let you know, in the summertime, our village peak load is around 34 kW. So this was providing about half of the power. And our village actually only has three 65 kilowatt diesel generators that's able, and usually only one runs um, year round to power the device. So if this, if this device were to be commercialized, it would displace 18,000 gallons of diesel. That would save us $133,000 a year. This price, this savings is still realized because even though the price of fuel may continue to decrease, rural Alaska is seeing an increase in the transportation costs of getting fuel. So we see this as a very stable and conservative number. If this were to be commercialized by 2017, it'd be the first commercial installation of a hydrokinetic power system in Alaska. Um, and if we had two, that would take care of nearly our whole power demand. 
a little bit about its assembly, deployment, and retrieval. That will, that's a testament that if it can succeed in Igiagig, it can be deployed anywhere in the planet, in my humble opinion, because this device was trucked from Eastport, Maine, all the way to Seattle. It got on a barge and went from Seattle to Anchorage. It got on a truck, went from Anchorage to Homer. It got on another barge and went eight hours over the Cook Inlet, and then it got put on some trucks, and it went two hours over a one-lane mountain pass, and then it got put on a lake barge, and it went 90 miles down some of the <laughs> rapid <laughs> environment. And what you see in photo one is it arriving on the lake barge. Now, mind you, from there on, it was purely in the hands of local contractors and local companies. In photo two, you see our local contracting company working with ORPC to weld together and assemble the device, put it, put it on its pontoons. And it was the, the excitement of the residential population for the last two summers. In fact, they said, what are they going to do next summer? <laughs> there will be nothing to watch. There are all the... <laughs> In three, they were deploying the anchors with the, local, the locally owned flexi float and excavators. In four, they were getting ready to launch it. In five is just an animation how it, it's um, sunk to the bottom, one side of the pontoon. Well, you, I don't know if you got a sense of it in the video, but one side sinks and then the other side goes down. And the villagers really liked it because you could float it quickly again. You could pump water in and float it if you had, if you had any issues. As well, it was plugged directly into our grid, and if we had any problems, it could be shut down immediately. And that didn't need to happen, but six is the photo. So the first season, it took two excavators, the flexi float barge, and two vessels to get the device deployed. After sitting down with locals and sitting down with ORPC, they went over how this could, how this could be made more efficient, and they came back in 2015, and this lonely 32-foot fishing vessel was able to push it into place, which being a fishing economy, we have no end of, of Bristol Bay boats to use, use for such a... Um. Some reflections I had in thinking back about the journey we've begun. It's been grueling, exhausting. It feels like we have come so far, but we have actually just begun. And we have... Um, we have a more confident population of people that, that are willing to partner with companies such as ORPC and, and to, to set a goal and to make it happen. Um, as a leader myself in the community, it's been important to inform the public about what's going on and the ORPC office did a great job of that and we also did that locally and we had many meetings and the most important part of the meetings were to manage the expectations of the community. We're not just going to demonstrate this is not going to displace diesel right away and you're not going to see an immediate cut in your fuel bill. But we will stabilize what we have going on. And they're, they're now developing a mentality of, um, you know, if there's no harm in trying and we have some economic benefits, either short term or long term, then, then why not? And more importantly, like, he, like the video showed in, in the beginning, we really have gotten on the map um, this mentality of we can't keep looking to other people to solve our problems. From now on, we're going to have to solve them ourselves. And Igiagig is a population of 70, like I said, and we don't have a very loud voice in government. It might be the same for the main islands, but we feel that um, demonstrating new technology successfully, such as the RivGen unit, we now stand in a position to help inform our leaders on what works and what doesn't and what is culturally and environmentally appropriate for the regions we're in. So um, that was Senator Murkowski coming to visit Igiagig to do an energy tour this summer, July 1st. She's a wonderful senator, but she does not present anything like your Senator King. I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed that. <laughs> And uh, that's the end. I've reserved a bit of time for questions.